We are so pleased that everybody has hung in so long today. We are, uh, we've got a terrific panel here, and what we'll be doing is we'll be shortening uh, the end of the day, just to give you, give everyone a little bit of planning time. Uh, those that are, were in the Discovery uh, movie, what we're going to do is take some photographs of you all together with your families, and we'd like to have you kind of separate from the crowd at 5 o'clock, uh, and we'll go into a part of the ballroom door so we can take some pictures and, and, and get some nice shots of everybody because you're all here and so many of you are, 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 uh, are in the program. Uh, and what we're going to do is, uh, you know, we want to be really respectful of, um, that we have a lot of folks in government and we know that we want to be very respectful of resources. We're having uh, hors d'oeuvres, we have a host bar, we're, we moved the movie to six it always has been, but this allows people to go on and to have their dinner, and it allows us to manage our resources properly and, and, and that kind of thing, just for planning purposes. So I think we'll be pretty prompt at starting the premiere at 6.30, and we'll have a, a, a reception outside uh, between uh, 5.30 and 6.30, and, but those that are uh, in the film and your families, we'd like to have you kind of go into the ballroom, off to the side, and we'll take some pictures in front of the uh, front of the posters and, and uh, that'll be kind of fun to get everybody involved. So those that are on, uh, that uh, have remained on our WebEx and on our uh, global streaming, uh, we are starting our new panel, our next panel, a New Horizons uh, uh, Imaging Pain Management Rural and Vulnerable Populations. We've got a really great group here uh, to address this uh, uh, this issue, and I, we just want to remind everyone that uh, we are filming this uh, this segment. We think this is a really important segment in, in our future films. We're going to ask our panelists to kind of keep your comments to about uh, 20, 25 seconds so we can give you the best chance of being in the next stop because these are really important topics, and then we'll come back to you. And, uh, uh, and then for the rest of the uh, evening, for those that are here at the press club, uh, we'll go for pictures uh, and drinks for everybody that was in the, in the film. Everyone else, we've got a reception outside for you, and we'll start the film at 6.30. And uh, we'll be at 7.30, and you can go off to dinner and, and uh, have, have your evening. And we love the fact that everybody has hung in here with this, the great, great energy that they have. This is really an exciting uh, area. We know that we had Dr. McDowell speak uh, in the last panel that pain management is an absolutely greenfield opportunity. It has now moved up to the number one reason that we see a primary care doctor. We know that 40% of cancer patients die with intractable pain in America today. In America, where we, sp we spend more money than anybody on health care, four out of 10 cancer patients don't have their pain controlled. That's crazy. And I think as, as we put in the film, everyone owns it and no one owns it. Does everyone really have the skills to really practice good pain management? The answer is they really, we, we, really, we really haven't. And so Gladstone, as we go down, I, I think the first three of our panelists, we have Dr. McDowell, who's uh, cross-trained as a urologic oncologist, a urologic surgeon, as well as anesthesia and pain management, uh, goes all over the country and teaches people how to do procedures because he's a great surgeon in addition to understanding oncology for cancer, in addition to understanding pain. But the other issue is, is that vulnerable populations are the most vulnerable to pain, the most vulnerable to get addicted, and we had 15 to 16,000 deaths last year from narcotics that we really didn't need to because of how poor we manage pain. We'll ask uh, Dr. Bechtel to talk about uh, recent experience of reaching out to rural hospitals in uh, Florida and, and, and what your read is and, and, and what you're seeing. And again, a former uh, uh, flight surgeon with the Blue Angels. And, and, and frankly, we have so much to thank you for. Uh, Perry, uh, you know, just like I mentioned, Dr. Swenson being a servant leader, uh, uh, if it hadn't been for Dr. Bechtel, we wouldn't have uh, been flying with the Blue Angels and, got, and that wouldn't have been in our film. Dr. Zeltner uh, is going to address how they may have managed their vulnerable populations, but also almost all of the hospitals in Switzerland we would classify almost to be rural. So we're talking about rural because they're smaller uh, and they have small hospitals closer to people and, and what insights that we can have there. And 
Then as we move down, we know David uh, Hunt has a real passion for, the, for vulnerable populations and would like both he and uh, Regina to talk about that. And we have a, star, a, a, a latest add-on star. We've got Paul Moore from the uh, HRSA uh, and he's going to join us, the Health uh, Resources Services Administration, and uh, to tell us about the focus of rural and a real champion for rural with the Partnership for Patients. So I think we've got a great panel. Gladstone, lead us off. Uh, on this issue of pain, little deeper dive, and how big the opportunity really is uh, in this area. So we have a major healthcare crisis. We have an epidemic that is unrecognized. Um, of a population of, say, 311 million, at, at least 100 million people at any one time are in chronic pain. We, I used to tell you that we spend $100 billion treating back pain. It's 650, um, billion dollars in terms of lost productivity, healthcare costs. Um, and access is, is, is poor. I mean, there are, there's one pain doctor for about every 33,000 patients. If you're a man, a woman, or I'm sorry, if you're older, if you're a child, or if you're a female or a minority, you have less chance of getting um, the best pain control. So, it, it, it's a huge problem. Prescription deaths of uh, 15, 16,000 a year from, from prescription overdoses. Uh, three of, of four people who die from prescription overdoses weren't prescribed the medicine. They got it from a friend, they got it from a family member. So just, just a huge opportunity to make a big difference if we set up systems and use technologies to, to really manage patients. Perry. Uh, reaching out into the rural environment as we kind of talk about, and, and I think rural is, it is another, it is especially a pain issue, and you're an anesthesiologist, a neuroanesthesiologist, so you also kind of see that overlap between those things, but aren't our, our rural hospitals vulnerable populations by definition? Yeah, I've tried to make some <clears throat> connections between the uh, pain problem and the, the rural problem. Um, I went to, earlier this week actually on Tuesday, uh, to a hospital in a very uh, rural area of Georgia. As most people know, uh, many areas in southern Georgia, very rural, and uh, uh, have been uh, exceptionally adversely affected by the economy um, with increasing levels of poverty, 5% uh, over what they were in, even uh, 10 years ago. Uh, met with uh, ER doc, pharmacist, head of anesthe anesthesiology, um, several nurses, the head of nursing, and the anesthesiologist, or the, uh, the head of the pharmacy said, they, I told them what I was coming up for. And this was such an important topic for her. She said, I'll tell you what, I, I knew you were coming up to talk about some of the prescription drug uh, addiction issues and that sort of thing. And uh, she said, I, I went to two, of our, uh, two patients randomly selected in each of our 12 units for a total of 24 patients. Um, and uh, on admission, looked at their admission drugs. And I think uh, 18 out of the 24 we're on prescription narcotic medications from somewhere uh, about, uh, and all but one was on some sort of uh, adjunctive therapy for pain. And that's the degree of the problem, and that's their baseline coming in. It's an ever-growing problem in their population. The emergency room physician said he believes that um, prescription narcotic overdose may be the leading cause of death in young people in his county. He didn't have any data, but he said from his experience working there that may be a leading cause of death. Um, combination of uh, morbid obesity and uh, narcotic abuse with obstructive sleep apnea issues may be one of the leading causes there. So, so we have a pandemic. This is a pandemic. Now when you think about just the basics on medication management, and we have some of the leaders in the world and you know, uh, you know, in this room, uh, Dr. David Bates, Dr. David Klassen, and they'll tell you that the frequency of adverse drug events both in the ambulatory space and the acute care space is just staggering. And these medications are always in the top uh, you know, the top five. So we still have this problem. We've been talking about it for years. Uh, Dr. Zeltner, is, and for those that have just logged on or have come, up, come in recently, uh, we are really honored to have Dr. Zeltner as part of our TMIT team, uh, and he is the new assistant editor of the Journal for Patient Safety and uh, the director of the global programs, and we're really reaching out globally. We're learning a lot more. One of the things that most people don't realize is that the research money and innovation, because the FDA is so stalled, is moved offshore. 
So the innovation is being done now in Europe and in, in, in Asia, not here. Our FDA is so slow now that everything is moving offshore, so a lot of the new technologies and approaches uh, aren't here, although procedurally we're recognized as being the best. So they want to come over and learn how to do what we do, but then people will go back to Europe and study a drug or, or a procedure or a new device, which is really a shame, but that isn't our issue today. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Zeltner uh, in Switzerland uh, took care of 7 million people for 19 years at 60% of our cost and better outcomes. Oh, by the way, they take care of their vulnerable populations and every one of their hospitals we could almost classify as rural, about an average 180 beds, right? So, so tell us what we could learn from Switzerland that we could apply today. Well, two things. I, I think a system, a healthcare system should really be measured on how well it serves um, vulnerable populations. And that's, I think, the key indicator. And uh, coming to Switzerland, the, the most vulnerable population we have are illegal immigrants. And we really focus very much on looking what do we, can we do to serve illegal immigrants. And actually, uh, a lot of enormous problems. And, the, the problem starts with the doctors who uh, serve them, uh, whether they can get the names or not the names because they're not known to the police. Do they need to give the names to the police? And we solved, I would say, 95% of that. And uh, in Switzerland, by now, illegal immigrants even can get a health insurance plan, and the government will pay for it. But. Uh, the government is split such that you don't get the name to those who then want to prosecute and expel them. Uh, so I think it makes sense to look into the most vulnerable populations and to say, is our system uh, such that we can really serve them? I'm glad to talk about the small hospitals in a minute. So, great. Uh, and I know we have uh, uh, Sharon Rosemark here from one of our uh, uh, safety net hospitals, and they take care of our vulnerable populations. And David and I have had numerous conversations about the fact that uh, the, majority, uh, the, the majority of minorities in America that are becoming the majority uh, are treated at only 300 hospitals out of almost 6,000. So, we know where they are, and we know they're in urban communities, and we know that they have unique patient safety issues. Uh, David, thoughts there about the uniqueness of that vulnerable population group, and then Regina will talk about, uh, from the consumer perspective, vulnerabilities of the, of the poor who can't have access. Well, health outcome disparities among the poor and underserved in our country is absolutely uh, a, a huge issue, and it really has become a focus now at HHS. Why? There are a number of reasons. There's a moral uh, responsibility, an ethical responsibility, but there's also a fiduciary responsibility. When you look at the cost of providing disparate care, it actually accounts for about one-third of the increase in health care spending that we have every year. So there are a lot of aspects to it that we really have to address. When you look at the care of those for whom the, the least common denominator is the best possible care that they can expect to see, we see there are a number of opportunities for improvement, and those opportunities are very often facilitated, I'm sort of a one-trick uh, uh, pony, through health IT. That is to say that we've been able to see time and time again when you drive performance levels to maximal levels, often using health IT, healthcare disparities start to melt away. That's one big thing that we really want to try to promote. And one reason I'm so passionate about health IT is that it provides finally a path that we can actually use to eliminate healthcare disparities. When we talk about vulnerable populations and, and we talk about poor, the, the poor being a vulnerable population, you know, I hearken back to one of the great programs, and if Dennis Wagner is, is, is here, I, I talk about him being one of the greatest social entrepreneurs on the planet. And it's, when I first met him, he was working with the, the, the 100 Zero program, 100% access, zero disparity. And I was asked by the administration that came in to look at the work that they were doing, thinking that this was a grant that shouldn't go on. And my gosh, 
what did we find out? That if we take care of the poor in a community, Asheville, uh, North Carolina, when, when the doctors took care of the poor in agreement with the hospitals admitting them and not pushing back, in agreement with the pharmacies taking care of their meds, uh, and the government kicked in what, what it could, what happened? People that were working 70% 70, 70 of the time could work 100% of the time mm -hmm. and they got health care insurance and the community turned around yeah. and so I came up with this ma mathematical metric called return to community and all I did was roll up the ROI of each one of them and showed the numbers to the, that presidential administration and they said, that works. Mm -hmm. and, and so there's a return on taking care of the vulnerable populations because yeah. we don't allow them get to get to the emergency department. They don't get a stage two cancer or, a, or metastases uh, in time. So the vulnerable, and, and Regina, I've heard you speak about this, so share your thoughts. And, and again, in 25 second bites so I can right. make sure they get you in the next documentary. Have you ever heard of green drops? They're, um, they were made in the 1930s. They were this medicine that would cure everything. You could, you could mix it with sugar, and you could put it in your mouth, or you could, you could put it in your ear if you warmed it up, or you could rub it on your body. And when I was a child, my mom still had her bottle of green drops. <laughs> and when I was sick, she would pour it and put the sugar in, and she would give it to me when my throat was hurting or when my ear was infected, because we couldn't afford to go to the doctor. And if we became very, very sick to the point that she was worried that something might happen to us, and when it happened to us meant we might die, then she would take us to the doctor. When I was in older elementary school, I broke my arm on the playground, well, part of it. It was like a fracture. And um, the principal put me in the office, and my dad came to pick me up. I don't ever want you to do sports again because we can't afford it. And I never did do sports again. I sprained my ankle wearing a sandal when I was 10. And I was told never, ever wear sandals ever again. And to this day, I never have. See, we're taught how to live under an uninsured system. We're taught to only go to the doctor when we become so sick that we're about to die. And when we become adults, those lessons ingrained in our childhood stay with us for the rest of our life. So I can't help but wonder, if I'd been raised differently, would I have pushed my husband harder to find out what was wrong with him, rather than let him get so sick that he died? We must have an equal appreciation for all populations. I've gone into meetings like this one, and I've heard people say at the table, you know, they're not smart enough to understand. We can't give them the imaging results so they can't understand it. They're not all college educated like us. And that's when I slam my hand down on the table and say, I only have a high school degree, but I can understand this. So please, don't assume that a person who is uneducated is unintelligent. And finally, when we talk about disparity, you must get on the ground with us to find out what's wrong with us. I've been in meetings like this one where they say, why aren't the poor people eating better? And I said, hey, have you thought about redesigning the food push carts that we push 10 blocks down the street to get our food home? When those wheels fall off after you bought it and it cost $20, $20 you didn't have, you probably stopped buying fruit because fruit is too heavy. You probably go to ramen noodles because ramen noodles are light and you can hold a child in one arm and push a cart and take ramen noodles home. So we must look at the entire web of what we're doing to address disparity. Thank you. So Paul, you <clears throat> with HRSA, and we've talked about the vulnerable populations and the rural populations, and it turns out that there's a big overlap, isn't there? There is. As you talk about quality care, you, you have to say that the first part of any quality care is access to care. 
And, and as my colleague mentioned, uh, IT brings, technology brings a great possibility for that. And it's not, it, you know, access also includes being able to afford it, even if it's there, if you don't, you don't have access to it, if you can't afford it. But even if that's fixed, where, you know, insurance, more folks have coverage and, and insurance takes care of the cost. Insurance is not cover, is not access, it's coverage. And there still needs to be the, the folks there to provide the care. In rural America, about 20% of the population lives there, but only about 10% of the providers. And I'm not just talking about physicians. I'm talking about physicians, pharmacists, nurses, the entire resource that's there. And so that creates an access problem. Sometimes it's geographical, sometimes it's economic. It can be any number of things. But the first thing to any quality program is to have access to it. That's why I hold out great hope for telemedicine and other technologies. It is a key. It is a key to leveraging the resources that there. This nation cannot afford to have haves and have nots based on jobs. So Dr. Dr. Zeltner? brings me back. I mean, uh, in Switzerland, we have 7 million, as he said. We have, for these 7 million, you have 350 hospitals, which, I mean, for everyone who organized the health system, says it's crazy. And, I mean, our economists said that we need 80 to 100, so let's close 250. Uh, we started doing that and stopped, because uh, what we realize is, which is a comfort in one way, is from each home in Switzerland to the next hospital is something like three to five miles. For an old population, that's a wonderful thing to have. And so uh, I think the response of the system must be, let it be such that the access, even for one vulnerable groups, is given. And with the new technologies, and we have them, um, Let's organize the system that even small units can deliver a good service. And that can be done. And I think uh, uh, the whole notion of two small hospitals need to be rethought. And we need to be really very close to the patients and to their families. And it can be done. Gladstone. Back to, back to the pain, the new horizons in pain management. So if we were looking at the intersection of the, of the vulnerable populations and poor, pain, new horizons, and know that we have to be responsible with our resources, uh, what in insights can you give us? Because this is our next wave of uh, research that we're going to be focusing on is pain management, and we're, we're going to pull together, you know, what are the high impact, high volume scenarios and cases that we can help the fastest? Uh, and it sounds like back pain is a, is a, major, uh, is a major issue. Is that, is that a fair category of where the problem is? Absolutely. Major issue, major problem, and not everybody needs surgery. Not everybody can have surgery, so a lot of people are on pain medicine. The problem is, is that you guys are familiar with Vicodin, Lortab, so that's hydrocodone. 99% of the world's supply of hydrocodone is prescribed in the United States, 99%. It, it's cheap, and patients can get this. They can't get some long-acting medications from their, their healthcare care um, their healthcare insurance companies, because they're a little bit more expensive. Controlled substances may be more costly than the cheaper medicines. And so patients through financial disincentives, i.e., it costs you a $75 copay versus a $3 copay, are often pushed towards the, the cheaper substances because there's more margin for the healthcare, for the insurance companies. That just, that just promulgates the whole issue of um, short-acting opioids leading to some people making money off of them, um, some people overusing them because that's all they, they have. So I think we need to really look at this and, and redesign our healthcare delivery systems. We need to redesign what types of drugs are covered for patients. We need to think about um, targeted drug delivery. You know, taking somebody who's on 1,200 milligrams of OxyContin every day and, you know, I work a lot with companies like Med Medtronic that are looking for targeted drug delivery where we can use devices to deliver less medicine in a, in a safer mode or use digital technologies, use pacemaking devices to treat chronic pain 
rather than continuing to prescribe high-dose opioids. But we really have this paradox between untreated or undertreated pain and substance abuse. And we're not doing very well with either one of them. We are trying to treat pain better, but we're giving more of, of the wrong kinds of, of medicine that are going out and leading to prescription drug deaths. And then we are, we are we're under treating pain because people are worried about legal issues, regulatory issues. And then there's just a lot of a lack of, of, of knowledge. We need to get back to educating our medical students, our nursing students, and then really setting up systems to, to protect patients. So I think partnership for patient, health information technologies are, are really crucial. Well, we're, we're going to wrap up this panel, but one of the things that uh, is, has become very clear working with the purchasing community is that we really need to get into a mode of expect it, ask for it, demand it, and we need to really work with our employers because we worked, we've worked with employers for a long time. Uh, LeapFrog Group is one of the areas that we've worked with them, but we've worked with them in other ways. And when you talk to a major employer that has 100,000 or 50,000 or 20,000 or 25,000 employees, and you start to tell them the benefits of better pain management to put people back to work and not have them go down the path of rehab and destroy their family and be able to use some of these new technologies and look at it in a fully loaded cost. I mean, you know, we talk about the wonderful things of leadership and everything else, but actually there's a great return on investment by leading. There really is. There's a return on investment by properly taking care of your employees. Bob told us that it's important to take care of our employees as if they were our children. Well, would you want your child to get addicted because the insurance company figures it's cheaper to give them pain medicine than it is a, a neurostimulator or a pain pump or whatever? And the answer is no, but we just don't know it. So I think an educated and informed uh, population about pain is a wonderful opportunity, Ed, as we look at what to do with the WHO and as we expand the five rights, we've got a five rights pain for pain you know, trajectory that we want to take with this. And it's a low-hanging fruit opportunity. Uh, and I think that when I, I learned about this, actually, by working with Gladstone, and I put a, a project together at Harvard when I was senior fellow at Harvard, and I'm a cancer doctor, and I don't know whether Dave Part is still here, but I, I was shocked to find out that 40% of cancer patients die with intractable pain. And you and I spent, I spent half my life taking care of pain, and I didn't know that. So if I didn't know it, a lot of people didn't know it. I had a huge practice. So I think there's a great opportunity. Thank you guys so much. I think it's a great opportunity. Thanks for keeping us uh, focused on it. And the, rural, and the uh, vulnerable populations and rural populations, as we go after an election, if we get major cuts in, in reimbursement, they're going to be more vulnerable. Because our small communities, they're the number one or number two employer in small communities. You shut down small hospitals, you shut down a community and you have an even more vulnerable population. I'm not sure we've really thought that through, and I think that's why our trustees need to step up and say, let's take some of that endowment funding and put it to work in safety and quality and clean up our act so that we'll be able to be viable at a later time. And I, I think that's one of our messages. Yeah. Bob, or, go ahead. Bob Chapman's, um, what, what he's taught us about this, this, this loving concept, um, taking care of, of, of each other. I think we need to have this covenant concept. You know, covenant is a solemn or sometimes sacred agreement between two people to either do something or, or refrain from it. I think we need to go back to that covenant concept of I'm going to take better care of, of, of you than I take care of myself, but I expect you to take better care of me. And so we get away from this me, me um, society and get back to the we society where we're all inclusive because if, if we take care of everybody, all the boats rise. Yeah. Great. We're going to, uh, so that we are stick to our time, uh, we're, we are going to uh, wrap up with a sh an abbreviated session, but we'd like to talk about some of the next steps that, and uh, I see that we have uh, 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 Dennis Wagner here. We, had, we talked a little bit about the partnership for patients and integrating across uh, some of these activities that we've talked about. David Bates, maybe w what we could do is, is come up and have an abbreviated kind of next steps and talk about a little bit of a wrap up of some of the topics that we've covered during the day, and I'd like to give I think the partnership is a reconciling force of a lot of the 
activities that, that, that we see and give you a chance maybe to articulate where that's going, to just leave us with that and, uh, and tell us the trajectory that we're following. I'd like to address the wrap up on the IOM, uh, uh, the IOM report and some of the recommendations that we had there. So if Dr. Klassen is here, and what we'll do is we'll kind of finish uh, in a, about a 20, 20 minute sort of time frame. Uh, we're, we have a reception outside. We'll be turning off the WebEx and our uh, global streaming. We want to thank this panel, and we'll wrap up with one more kind of talking about what, you know, what, we, what do we learn today and what are the action steps that we can take. Thank you very much, y'all. Okay.